Let's begin our time together by uniting our hearts in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, once more we turn to you and call upon you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your eternal Son, our beloved Savior. And in his name, we pray for you to pour out the Holy Spirit upon us, especially here at North American Martyrs, consecrated to those who have borne witness to Christ with their very lives and in holy deaths. We pray that at this time in history and at this particular point in our country's history, you would give to us a boldness to go forth and to proclaim the gospel because all authority in heaven and earth has been given to your son. And so in his name, we pray for you to assist us and teach us and especially bless our families. And hear us as we pray the family prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, we all have certain experiences that turn out to be life-defining moments, and usually we don't even see them coming. Even after they happen, you don't always recognize the significance. Several years ago, I had one of those. I was downtown in Pittsburgh, where I grew up, looking for Mercy Hospital to visit a friend who only had a few days of life left. I knew I was close, but I was also lost. I kept going around the block. I grew up in Pittsburgh, but I grew up Protestant, so I knew right where Presbyterian Hospital was but I couldn't figure out where the Sisters of Mercy had tucked away their fine institution. So I finally pulled over and I asked a fellow on the sidewalk for directions. He looked at me and he laughed. And I'm like, what's so funny? He said, you're practically there. And I said, well, fine, but I can't seem to find it. He said, look, just turn down pride and you'll find mercy. And he walked away with this little smirk. And I'm thinking, that's the last time I asked for directions until I looked straight ahead and the sign, the street sign read Pride Avenue. And when I turned down Pride, sure enough, I found Mercy staring me in the face. And I realized in retrospect, that's the story of my life. It's just a series of upward falls where God humbles us and then he raises us up. And I would say to you that as we think about how we can do the new evangelization. We've been focusing all day on how it is that in the family fully alive, the gospel becomes real. And, and not just our own homes, because the church is the family of God, the very family that God is fathering. And it's not less of a family than the Hans, but far more. It's not a family in any kind of metaphorical way. It really is our home and will be in a billion years in a way that 718 Bellevue won't be for our kids. And so we have to reorient ourselves that way and allow things to happen to us that humble us. And in the process, we'll turn down pride and we'll find mercy. And not just for ourselves, but for others as well. The new evangelization by now, I hope, is more than a cliche. It's more than just ecclesiastical jargon. I hope by now you can understand that it is a real and doable thing. And what is it, as John Paul defined it, and as we have heard now from Pope Benedict and now Pope Francis, it consists of re-evangelizing the de-Christianized, or even simpler, evangelizing the baptized by helping all people to come back into a deeper personal relationship with Jesus. 
Now, what does that mean practically? Well, sociological surveys have shown us how important it is for us today. You probably heard about the Pew Research Center and the study they did just a couple of years ago on American Catholics. After over a year of research, the results are as follows. Roughly 30% of Americans raised Catholic describe themselves as still practicing, quote unquote, which in the survey means they attend mass at least once a month. Another 38% hang on to the Catholic label. They prefer to be called cultural Catholics, but seldom or never attend mass at all. That leaves 32% who no longer want to be considered Catholic in any way. 3% are non-Christian, 14% unaffiliated, 15% have become fundamentalist, Protestant or independent, non-denominational Christians. If the Good Shepherd leaves the 99 to find the one, what are we looking at here? No pastor, no bishop, no pope can accomplish what is needed without the help of us all. That's why the new evangelization really is a matter of life and death, eternal life and everlasting death. The stakes are high. I'm not sure they could be any higher, but I am convinced as I mentioned this morning, that if God could do it before, in a culture of death known as the Roman Empire, against all odds, there's no reason for us to conclude that he can't do it again. In fact, I think we can safely, I think we can safely say that he wants to do it more than we want him to. And he's capable of doing more than we have enough faith to ask him to. But he's asking us simply for a yes, a sincere yes from the heart. Yes to the family. Yes to the friendships. Yes to the neighborhood. Yes to the parish. Whatever circumstances of life we face, God wants to reach others through us, but he also wants to continue to reach us. And I would say that the family is the principal way that he wishes to do that. If you go back to the old evangelization and study what happened, we tend to focus upon the apostles, upon the martyrs, upon the fathers of the church, which is a good thing. But a very famous sociologist of religion named Professor Rodney Stark wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity when he was still an agnostic. And he simply did his sociological homework and concluded that Christianity expanded at roughly 40% per decade for over two and a half centuries, mostly through the witness of ordinary Christians in family life, in marriages that stayed together, in parents who didn't abort or abandon their babies, at times of crisis and pestilence, when even the doctors wouldn't stick around, Christian families did, they reached out. The study that went into the book is what caused Professor Stark later on to acknowledge that this faith is like no other. That in the history of world religions, what we see in the first three or four centuries is unprecedented. But it's also, he's convinced and so am I, something that is repeatable, something that God wishes to do again and again and again through ordinary people, extraordinary graces. And I want to address my brothers in Christ especially. Because a lot of religion is done mostly by women, in parishes, in dioceses, in Bible studies, and also in families. And I think we know deep down that we are called upon to be more than just practicing Catholics. We are called upon to be husbands who are faithful, and fathers who are engaged, and yet our culture doesn't make it easy, it makes it hard. And yet what we also have found through sociological surveys is highly relevant. The Southern Baptist Convention just did a multi-year survey, a study of families across the country. 
some rather remarkable results. If a child is the first in the family to experience the grace of conversion, there's a 3.7% probability that the rest of the family will become Christian. If the mother is the first in the family to experience this grace of conversion, there's a 17% chance it quintuples that the rest of the family will follow. If the father is the first in the family to experience the grace of conversion, there is a 93% probability that the rest of the family will follow. That's staggering. It goes on. If a father does not go to church, no matter how faithful his wife's devotions are, one child in 50 becomes a regular worshiper for the rest of their lives. But if a father does go regularly, regardless of the practice and devotion of the mother, between two thirds and three quarters of the children become regular worshipers for the rest of their lives. What can we conclude? that if the new evangelization is going to succeed, it's going to depend upon men of God, Catholic men who become sons of God, brothers in Christ, followers of Jesus, but not only as faithful disciples, but as fruitful apostles, but most especially as fathers in the family. What does that mean? How does it look like? You know, I would say this, that, you know, depending upon your circumstances, there are different ways. I would say, in our home, I've been leading family prayer, but not because I'm a professor of theology, but just because this is how I understand it. So the family rosary, morning devotions. We also have what we call the family blessing. We're in the morning, and then again in the evening, I gather my kids, and I lay my hands upon them. And I say, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the Father, and the communion be be with you, Michael, Gabriel, Hannah, Jeremiah, Joseph, and David, today and forever, till we're in heaven together. Now that they're growing up, now that they're moving on, I was just out in Virginia two weeks ago, and I watched my, my daughter do it. I was out in South Bend three weeks ago, and I watched my son Michael bless his four kids at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. But it isn't just prayer, it isn't just the rosary, it isn't just devotions, it's ordinary things as well. Grace before meals, having meals together as a family, making a priority of really investing in what your kids are up to. Not just baseball, not just soccer, but their studies as well. I am convinced that if men rise to the challenge, the Holy Spirit will be poured out in an extraordinary way. I'm also convinced that we as men need to deepen our relationship with Jesus, most especially in the Holy Eucharist. And so I want to address something, building upon what I had shared earlier today, and that is that the new evangelization must be based on the Eucharist. That is how we ourselves are evangelized, and that is also how we turn around and evangelize others. When we go to Mass, we inhale the breath of God's Spirit. We ingest the Word made flesh in the Holy Eucharist. And at the end of the Mass, what do we hear? Well, it's usually translated something like, this Mass is ended. But in the Latin, what is the phrase? Ita misa est. Misa is, of course, where we get the word Mass. But it's also where we get the word mission. Because we are being sent out As missionaries, we've inhaled as the mystical body of Christ. It's time now to exhale the breath of God's Spirit. We have ingested and received the gift of God's Word, the Word made flesh in the Holy Eucharist, and it's now time to go forth and share that as well. The new evangelization and what we do in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass are inseparably connected like inhaling and exhaling. It's who we are. It's what we do. And there's something about it that is doable through friendship, by sharing joy, by enjoying being Catholic. This came home to me, oh, a couple years ago. I was stopped at the airport by a friend. I didn't know him. I thought he was just, he came up and said, are you Scott? I'm like, yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, you watch EWT? And he's like, don't you recognize me? And I'm thinking, that's not how TV works. 
<laughs> it's, it's a one-way medium. You see me, I can't see you back. And he's like, come on. St. Clair High School, 75. And I'm like, the lights came on. Chris, long time, no see. And we shook hands. He gave me a big hug. And he's like, I've been looking forward to this day. And I'm thinking, well, it's good to see you, but I haven't been looking. Why? Why? And he said, because for years, I have been dying to tell you the news that I am now what you are. And that is, I'm an evangelical, Bible-believing Christian. I'm no longer Catholic. You know, like me and my buddies were in high school. And this is a supremely awkward moment for me. <laughs> and I look and I say, well, that's great, Chris, because I've got news for you because I'm an evangelical, Bible-believing Catholic Christian. <laughs> and his eyes got wide, his jaw dropped. No way, not you. And I'm like, yeah, why, what happened? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm heading to my flight, you're heading to yours, here's my card, he gave me his. Within a week, we were on the phone. Within about a minute, we had exchanged greetings in the pleasantries, and he could not wait. He said, okay, Scott, you remember you'd walk into the cafeteria, we might be talking the Steelers or the Pirates or the weather. You'd sit down and you'd ask us questions like this one. Where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the mass? You remember that? And I'm like, honestly, no, but that sounds like something I would have done. Oh, you did. Yeah, <laughs> more than once. And, and you'd always go on to say that in the New Testament, the mass is a meal and that the sacrifice is Calvary. You remember that? And I'm like, no, but again, that sounds like what I would have said. He said, well, that's now what I believe. And so pardon me if I turn the cafeteria tables around and put the question to you like you did to us. Where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the mass? And I'm thinking, you know, make my day as Kim playing on the, the pit bull. <laughs> and so I said a prayer because I wasn't sure exactly what would work the best because he's not an academic, and yet he went to med school, he's a broker, he's leading Bible studies. And so I said, Chris, okay, first of all, let's acknowledge the fact that as evangelical, Bible-believing Christians, whether we're Catholic or Protestant, we share a whole lot in common. He's like, do we? I'm like, oh yeah. The common ground is much larger than where we diverge. And I said, let's just recognize how much common ground we stand on together, and then we can address the differences. And I want to just stop for a moment and suggest you do that, do that also. Because when you have friends or family members who may have left or who may have never been Catholic, it's so easy to kind of fixate on the differences and obsess with all of the disagreements. And I think it's more important to step back and say, okay, let's identify the common ground. For one thing, I said, Chris, I do believe that the Mass is a meal. It's the Last Supper. It's the Lord's Supper. And so at one level, we can still affirm that. On the other hand, I would also say that Calvary is the sacrifice. And you could hear him sigh. Whew, I thought you were really a Catholic. I'm like, well, I am, but that's what we believe. And he said, well, back in the 70s, I was never too sure. <laughs> I'm like, well, I apologize about that. But... The fact is, we do believe that the Mass is a meal, that Calvary is the sacrifice, but I said, how is it that we as Christians came to that common belief when in fact, on Good Friday, not a single devout Jew witnessing the crucifixion could have possibly gone home and described Calvary as a sacrifice? He said, what are you talking about? And I said, what I'm talking about is the plain and simple truth that the early church fathers showed me that for devout Jews, even the disciples who were following Jesus for years, to witness Calvary would not have been to witness a sacrifice. Because as devout Jews, they would have known that a sacrifice can only take place inside the Jerusalem temple, on top of an altar, with a Levite standing there to preside at the liturgy of sacrifice, whereas Jesus was crucified outside the walls, far from the temple where there were no altars with Levites standing by to preside at a liturgy of sacrifice. What we would have witnessed, what we would have gone home and described, Chris, to our family members and to our friends would not have been a sacrifice. It would have been a Roman execution, plain and simple. 
and a rather brutal one at that. So the question we've got to answer is this, how in the world did a Roman execution get turned into not only a sacrifice, but one that is so holy that it ended up retiring all of the animal offerings that were there in the temple? And he's like, I never thought of that before. I'm like, I hadn't either. But when I began to go deeper into the Bible and read the early church fathers, I found out that that's what they saw and that's what they said. And so I went in search of an answer. How does a Roman execution get turned into the holiest sacrifice of all? And I said, for the early church fathers, the answer was pretty plain. It was found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, where Paul told the church in Corinth, the Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. And I said, that's really the key that unlocks the door and answers the question. But I didn't see exactly or immediately how. But when you read the early church fathers, you discover that the only way to understand Good Friday is to look at it in the light of Holy Thursday. Because what was Jesus doing the night before? He was in the upper room. He was with the 12 disciples. But what was he doing with them? He was celebrating the Passover for the very last time. But that's not all, Chris. He wasn't just celebrating, he was fulfilling it. As the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, he was fulfilling the Passover of the Old Covenant, but not in order to retire it, but to transform it into the Passover of the New Covenant. And I said, that's the key that Paul gave the Corinthians. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. And the feast that he goes on to recount to the Corinthians in the subsequent chapters is the Eucharist. And no wonder, because what was he doing while he was celebrating the Passover? He was fulfilling it, but transforming it into the new. But what was the Passover back in the Old Covenant? Was it just simply a meal? No, Chris, it was a sacrifice first and foremost. Just ask any lamb, he'll tell you. And if that's true in the Old Covenant, it isn't less true in the New, but it's even more. And so there is a meal aspect, but that's a sacrificial communion upon the sacrificial offering. Again, in the old or the new. And so if the Passover in the old covenant had to be a sacrifice, the Passover of the new covenant has to be as well, or else it's not a Passover. And so this explains what Jesus was saying and doing with the disciples, because most all of it was very familiar. They'd all grown up devout Jews. They had celebrated the Passover every year. But then suddenly near the beginning of the supper, beginning the Passover, he took the unleavened bread and said words that we've heard many times, but they never heard before. What did he say? This is my body, which will be given up for you. What was that? Nobody interrupted. Nobody asked for an explanation. In a a moment or two, they were back on track, Chris, but the fact is they must have wondered what that rhetorical flourish was about because you don't just improvise in a sacred liturgy like the Passover. But they were back on track until near the end when he took the the chalice, the third cup known as the cup of blessing. And once again, he said things they never heard before that we've heard all of our lives. And what were the words? He said, this is the cup or the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the New Testament. In Greek, kainē, do you think it can be translated New Covenant or New Testament? Either way. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Covenant, the blood of the New Testament poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. And once again, they must have wondered, what is this new ritual, this new rhetoric? Is there any reality here? But nobody interrupted, nobody demanded an explanation. And a few moments later, they were leaving the upper room to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and everything began to unfold in such a tragic way, they probably wondered what was all of that about, but nobody bothered to ask. But I said, Chris, when you look at what he was saying and doing, you've got to realize it was more than rhetoric. It was more than ritual. There was, in fact, a reality there because he was celebrating the Passover of the Old Covenant precisely for the purpose of transforming it into the new. And if the Eucharist that he instituted is the Passover of the New Covenant, as Paul describes it, then it can't be just a meal or else it's not a Passover. It has to initiate, it has to start off as a sacrifice, which alone explains the language that he employed that they never heard before. This is my body, which will be given up for you. 
This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. You see, Chris, he didn't lose his life at Calvary on Good Friday if he'd already made it a gift of love on Holy Thursday by instituting the Eucharist. He wasn't the victim of Roman violence as much as he was the victim of divine love and mercy. I said, if the Mass that he instituted, the Eucharist, is just a meal, then Calvary is just an execution. But only if the Eucharist that he instituted as the Passover of the New Covenant is where the sacrifice was initiated do we find that Calvary is precisely where that sacrifice was consummated. They're inseparable. You can't understand either one without the other. And he's like, wait, back up. Say that thing again. Like what? I said, a lot. He said, if the Mass is just a meal? I said, yeah, then Calvary is just an execution. But if the Mass is the Passover of the New Covenant, it can't be just a meal. It has to be a sacrifice. And then suddenly, what he's saying and doing makes total sense. And not only on Holy Thursday, but on Good Friday. Because Holy Thursday is what transforms Good Friday from being an execution into becoming the climax of the sacrifice. And I said, and likewise, Easter Sunday is what transforms the sacrifice into a sacrament, which they now can do in memory of him because his body is no longer bleeding on the cross. It's no longer buried in the tomb. It's raised from the dead. It's ascended into heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. And this is why, when he was walking on the road with Clopas and his companion, opening up the Bible, they admitted later on, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened up the scriptures? But never once, Chris, not one moment did they recognize the resurrected Lord until he did what? until he took, blessed, broke, and gave the bread. And then suddenly their eyes were opened in the breaking of the bread to the resurrected Lord. And just as suddenly he disappeared. <coughs> and when he disappeared, they turned to each other and what did they do? They finally admitted, were not our hearts burning within us as he opened up the scriptures? They got up that very hour, they walked all the way back to Jerusalem, and they told the apostles how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the triduum. This is the Paschal mystery. This is what we're preparing all Lent to sacrifice in Holy Week, to celebrate, to enter into this holy sacrifice and this holy sacrament. And there I was for over an hour explaining to a cradle Catholic who had become an ex-Catholic and now an anti-Catholic how only the Catholic teaching can explain why it is that all Christians see Calvary in a way that not a single Jew could have possibly understood it on Good Friday. If the Mass is just a meal, Calvary is just an execution. But if the Eucharist that he institutes is the Passover of the New Covenant, then and only then do we find out how Calvary is the consummation of that sacrifice. He wasn't losing his life, as a victim of violence, he was finishing the task of giving it to us. <laughs> An hour later, Chris is like, whoa, this is so much. And so we hung up. But not before he promised to call me back in a week. He said, I want to pick up where we leave off. And so one week later, he called me back. And he said, okay, let's go back to that question. Where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? And I said, well, you remember what I was pointing out before, that the Mass can't be just a meal, and he finished my sentence, or else Calvary would be just an execution. So if the Mass is where the sacrifice begins, and then he finished that, then Calvary is clearly where it is climaxed or consummated. And I'm like, right. But let's go back to the question again, because the way I put it to you, the way you put it to me, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? You and I both, again, need to recognize how much common ground we share because of this precious family heirloom that we call the New Testament. The 27 books that begin with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and end with the book of Revelation. This is the New Testament. 
And I wanted to be a New Testament Christian back in high school just like you want to be. And I still long to be a faithful and obedient New Testament Christian. And I'm grateful God, to God, Chris, for the gift of the New Testament that we share in common. And yet at the same time, I would say if we read the New Testament, we'll discover that it never once calls itself the New Testament. When we read the New Testament, we discover that Jesus only uses that phrase, the New Testament, or the New Covenant, on one occasion. And the only occasion when he ever used that phrase was in the upper room, on Holy Thursday, in Luke 22, there in verse 20. What is he saying? This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the New Testament the blood of the new covenant. It's the only time in the entire four gospels that he uses the word covenant and he calls it the new covenant, the new testament. This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new testament poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then what did he go on to say? Do this in memory of me. Do this. What is this? Well, this is the Eucharist. But he didn't call it the Eucharist. What did he call it, Chris? He called it the New Testament. He called it the New Covenant. So when we read the New Testament, and we find the phrase New Testament only used once by our Lord in the upper room, he says, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Covenant, the blood of the New Testament. Do this in memory of me. This is the Eucharist. The Eucharist is what he calls The New Testament, I said, Chris, the fact is, the New Testament was a sacrament long before it started to become a document. According to the document, that when you read the New Testament, you find the phrase the New Testament only used by our Lord once in Luke 22, 20. And I said, before Luke ever got around to writing his gospel, his mentor, St. Paul, had already used the phrase when he wrote 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 11.25, we actually find an earlier instance where the phrase, the New Testament, the New Covenant, is found in the New Testament, or the New Covenant. And what is Paul saying? He's recounting how on the night that he was betrayed, when he was at the table, he took bread, and then the chalice, and what does he say? This is the blood of the New Testament poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. I said, so both in Luke 22 and in 1 Corinthians 11, the earliest references to the New Testament in the New Testament reinforced the idea that the New Testament was a sacrament before it became a document according to the document. And he's like, there you go again. Wait, say that one more time. It was a sacrament? Yeah, before it became a document. And, and, and that's according to the document. Yeah, that's right. He didn't say, write this in memory of me. He didn't say, read this in memory of me. I said, Chris, he never wrote anything down. He can, never commanded them to write a thing. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad that some of them did, but most of them didn't. I said, we well, looked at the 12, less than half of them ended up contributing a single book to the collection of 27 that you and I call the New Testament but not because they were disobeying orders, but because he ordered them to do this in memory, not write this. And they all went out preaching the gospel, baptizing new converts. And then as we read at Pentecost in Acts 2.42, the breaking of the Eucharistic bread shows us that they were all doing this as the Eucharist in memory of him. And I said, this is why the early church wasn't sitting around waiting and wondering what are we supposed to believe Why won't one of you 12 sit down and write us some gospels or some epistles or an apocalypse or two? I said, because Jesus never wrote anything. He never commanded them to write anything. What he did is what they did as he commanded them, do this, not write this. And they were doing this everywhere the church spreads. The Eucharist is evident and central. And no wonder, because it's what Jesus calls the New Testament. It's what the New Testament calls the New Testament. So to get back to the question, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? When Jesus initiated the Mass, when he instituted the Eucharist, 
That's the only thing you ever call the New Testament. So the short answer is, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? The sacrifice of the Mass is the New Testament. And this explains why the books that were written 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years later, weren't the New Testament in the first century. They weren't the New Testament in the second century. People only began calling these books the New Testament in the third and fourth century. But in the first and second century, all the early believers referred the phrase the New Testament to what? Jesus called it, and that is the Eucharist. And I said the earliest reference we have to the New Testament being a document and not just a sacrament, as literature and not just liturgy, is around 191 AD. That's like over 150 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. And even that anonymous document doesn't call these books the New Testament, it refers to them as the books of the New Testament. And I said, Chris, when I investigated what the early church fathers meant by that, I realized that the New Testament for the first 200 years was simply the Eucharist. But since these were the books that some of the apostles ended up writing, like John and Matthew and Peter, since these were the books that they were writing in order to be read on Sunday morning in preparation for the celebration of the Eucharist, since the Eucharist is the New Testament, we'll refer to these as what? The books of the New Testament. This was a liturgical collection. The books were written to be read in the liturgy, in what we call the liturgy of the word, as preparation for the celebration of the Eucharist. But the Eucharist is the New Testament. These are the books of the New Testament, because when you read them in the light of the liturgy, they make so much more sense as Christ is fulfilling the old, as the Lamb who establishes the new, in preparation for the celebration of the new covenant, we'll read the old and we'll read the books of the New Testament, but we'll celebrate the Eucharist because the New Testament's a sacrament long before it starts to become a document. And when you read the document in light of the sacrament, you get more, not less, out of it. I said, the church's liturgical worship, the church's Eucharistic liturgy was the natural habitat, the original context in which these books were written, in which these books were proclaimed, in which these books were explained as the fulfillment of the old. And I said, you know, if you're gonna get more out of the New Testament, you gotta put it back in its original soil. I pointed out that, you know, you know, if you saw a scientist studying plants as a botanist, pulling plants up by the roots, you know, and taking them in the laboratory and looking at them under these hot bright lights, wondering why are they dying? Well, you wouldn't think much of them as a scientist because when you take something out of its natural habitat, that's what happens. When you take the New Testament out of the Eucharistic life of the Catholic Church, Chris, that's what causes 15, 20, 30, now over 40,000 denominations to be formed by men and women who sincerely believe that they're interpreting the New Testament better than those who came before them. They pass a polygraph, but they keep splitting God's family because they don't see that the New Testament is a sacrament, first and foremost. And only when you read the document in light of the sacrament, he's like, whoa, this is so much. I'm like, tell me about it. You know, I, I, I've done for you in two phone conversations what the early church fathers did to me over more than two years. But I said, Chris, remember, all I wanted to be back then was to be a New Testament Christian. Only it took years of study to realize that in order to be a New Testament Christian, I had to become a Eucharistic Catholic. He's like, whoa, okay, it's time. We gotta hang out. <laughs> so I did. And he called me back a week later, a glutton for punishment, <laughs> but a lover of the New Testament and someone who wanted to follow the word of God. But I pointed out in the third conversation that the word of God inspired is precious but the word of God incarnated is even more. And I quoted the catechism. I said, Chris, this is why for us as Catholics, Christianity is not a religion of the book, like Islam describes itself, like Judaism does, like Protestants do. I said, what the catechism does is echo the fathers who said Christianity is not a religion of the book, 
but it is a religion of the word. But the word is a person, more than what you find on a page. And when you read what you find on a page, in light of the person who is present in the Eucharist, it doesn't in any way devalue the document. It enriches it, and it deepens our capacity to get more and more out of it. We had conversations like this for weeks, for months. We were discussing the Eucharist. We got into baptism, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the communion of saints, the family of God, God's fatherhood. We even got into confession. I sent them a care package, about five or six books, The Lamb's Supper, Letter and Spirit, and Lord have mercy, the healing power of confession, knowing you're one confession away from coming home. And after I sent the, the box off, I didn't hear from them for weeks, for months. I went a little too fast. I pushed a little too hard, or so I thought. And then out of the blue, one Saturday afternoon, like this, I got a call. I looked at my cell phone. The caller ID was Chris. Hey, long time no here. How you doing? He's like, oh, we're doing great. Like, okay, cool. I haven't heard from you in so long. He said, well, you sent that box. It took us weeks to get through those books. <laughs> so, so you read them? He said, oh, yeah. In fact, just last week, Carol and I read together the Lord have mercy, the healing power of confession. I'm like, did you like it? He said, Scott, I went to med school. I'm like, so what? He said, talk about health care. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Comprehensive coverage for every member of the family. And Scott, we're on our way back from going to confession for the first time in over 30 years. And I was stunned. And I'm like, wow. And you're still in a good mood. <laughs> He's like, well, that's because tomorrow morning we're going to Mass and we're going to receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. The New Testament for the first time in more than three decades. And he said, we can't wait. And I couldn't find words. I was like, thanks be to God. By the time I hung up, I realized what had been happening over the course of weeks, months, and almost a year, the new evangelization. In the context of friendship, Chris and I were really good friends back then, but we are much better friends now. In the setting of joy, sharing with him how much I enjoy the New Testament, but how much joy I found when I discovered that the, the document is like a sign that points beyond itself to the sacrament to the real presence of Jesus, that to be a New Testament Christian means to become a Eucharistic Catholic. And through friendship and joy, and by means of the Eucharist, not only now have we shared friendship at a whole new level, but he's back in the parish nearest his home, leading, last I heard, two Bible studies a week. And also as a husband and a father, having led his kids out of the Catholic tradition, having raised them in an evangelical, Bible-believing, semi-fundamentalist context, he is now learning how to father them through the joy of the gospel in terms of spiritual friendship so that his oldest son, who at first thought I was a demon from hell, sent to deceive his dad by leading him into darkness, is now, well, I'm talking to him on the phone, Chris Jr., and he's also sharing with his friends at the local non-denominational independent church. Pray for his family, because what he's discovering is how God wishes to father his family through him, as a husband and as a dad, through prayer. But it's not easy, especially when your kids come of age and they make their own decisions and they decide not to be Catholic or they never really had the choice like his kids. The fact is, what we know from our own experience is that his name isn't Chris. His name is Legion, for there are so many people out there who have left the church, and many of them never really understood what it was they were rejecting. They didn't even understand it well enough to reject it intelligently. And so we have got to use friendship and conversation and prayer and just share the joy that we have for being sons and daughters of the Most High. Brothers and sisters who actually do share what family members share. 
And what is that flesh and blood? What did Jesus say? My flesh is food indeed. My blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And look close at that Greek word for abide, meno, literally means to share family life. This is what we do. And this is who we are. And this is why the new evangelization begins at home. But at the same time, it leads us back to the parish where we discover God's family, our eternal home, and a context that enables us through the grace of the sacraments, through the truth of God's word inspired, to go forth and to grow up and to share the gospel. I want to challenge you to ask our Lord later today for practical, concrete ways you can enjoy the gospel more to experience the grace of conversion today, tomorrow, and the next day. To enter more deeply into the joy of the gospel. And then as you inhale the breath of God's spirit, as you ingest tomorrow the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ in the Holy Eucharist, ask him to fulfill those words, ita misa est. The mass hasn't ended. It's barely begun. Because misa, mass, is our mission. We want to go exhale the breath of God's spirit. We want to share the truth of God's word. Not by preaching and teaching on the job, but by living it with joy in a way that is truly contagious, to make this faith infectious, and then stand back and watch. Because as you pray and as you share in the context of friendship, God is going to do things that you don't expect. He might not do the things that you desire, but I'm convinced in your family, in your neighborhood, with family members, with loved ones, with coworkers, he's going to reach them. And in the process, he's going to reach us even more because nothing makes the gospel come alive as much for me as it is when I share it with you. And you're gonna experience that same thing. Let's turn to him now as our Father and then unite our hearts in prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the joy of the gospel. We thank you for the gift of a divine friendship. We thank you for making us members of your family but we also ask you to forgive us for taking so many graces for granted. For so many years of our lives, we have received super abundant mercies, and yet we have sometimes taken them for granted. But as Lent reaches the climax, as we enter into Holy Week, we pray that our experience of Christ through the Eucharist might illuminate our understanding of Calvary and might cause us to enter into the joy of Easter, to receive him in the sacrament. And not just as a ritual duty, but as a reminder that you call us into a relationship that is closer and tighter than any family, than any natural friendship. Supernaturalize us this moment through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Enlighten our minds with the word of truth and then cause our hearts to be inflamed by the power and the beauty of your love. Then send us forth back into the families, back into our neighborhoods and our workplaces, and use us however you want and hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to have a little time for Q&A. Before we do, I want to just mention a few resources that are available, including this one called Consuming the Word, the New Testament and the Eucharist in the Early Church. 
This is sort of a sequel to a book I wrote years ago called The Lamb's Supper, The Mass is Heaven and Earth. In fact, it forms a trilogy. Lamb's Supper, Letter and Spirit, and Consuming the Word are designed to help ordinary Catholics to find extraordinary beauty in the scriptures when you read them in terms of the Eucharist. But this is designed to kind of build bridges to non-Catholics, to people who want to believe whatever the New Testament teaches and to show them what the New Testament is. I also want to mention this book called Living the Mysteries, a guide for unfinished Christians because a lot of people want to begin reading the early church fathers. That can be very expensive. You could spend hundreds of dollars for multi-volume sets and then try to read through thousands of pages. So I want to mention Living the Mysteries because it's an anthology of my favorite fathers written by, a, by me and my dear friend Mike Aquilina. It's 50 days of readings from the early fathers drawn from the Old Testament and the New, showing how it's all fulfilled in the seven sacraments. I also wanted to mention this book because of how Chris liked it so much. It's called Lord Have Mercy, The Healing Power of Confession. You've heard people say we ought to frequent the sacraments. But when you look at the seven, there are only two that you can receive frequently unless you're going to live on the door of death most of your life, right? And what are they? The Eucharist and penance, reconciliation, confession, whatever you call it, it is like health care, divine, guarantee, and it gives us eternal life. And so I wanted to recommend that. And also, my most recent book is entitled Joy to the World, subtitled How Christ's Coming Changed Everything and Still Does. Now, it might look like a Christmas book, and it came out in Advent, but it's only a Christmas book if you only need joy in Advent and Christmas. I need it personally all year around, and so I really want to recommend Joy to the World because it really is the key to the new evangelization. I just thought of one other one, too. Answering the New Atheism. A lot of our young people are being targeted by atheists who use Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, much more than you might realize in high school as well as college. When I found out how widespread it was, six, seven, eight million copies, and they're being really targeted for young people. I wrote a book with a dear friend of mine, Ben Weicker, called Answering the New Atheism, Dismantling Dawkins' Case Against God. So if you know people who have been tempted by atheism, I'd recommend that as well. Anyway, I see my bride up here, and so I want to kind of open it up for any kind of Q&A that you might have. Yeah, Kimberly just suggested that you all just stand up and take a break for a moment here. <laughs> Is there room? Yeah. And you can share this mic. How's that? Yeah. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. It's just the weirdest thing. Can't you hear it? Oh my goodness. Your first question was, are any of these e-books electronic books? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, you can all sit down. I took off my McDonald's mic. Do you want fries with that? You know, you've seen it before. Um, so that Kimberly and I can share it. The first question Father Connor mentioned, and that is, are these books available in electronic versions? And yes, they are. You can go to Amazon or you can go to other places too and find them on Kindle or a nook. Uh, there are electronic versions of almost all of the books that I have mentioned. Uh, I think Joy to the World is also just in the last few weeks. Any other questions? <coughs> uh, what, was there a defining moment for your conversion to Catholicism? Was there a moment or some sort of an event that happened to cause you? Or was it well, yes, there was, and yet at the same time, it took years. Uh, I like to tell the story, as I do in this book called The Lamb's Supper, of how for well over 10 years I had been studying scripture, learning Greek and Hebrew, reading the old and the new and the original languages and all of that. But as a PhD student who was investigating the Catholic faith in the early church, I had never been to mass. I never frankly wanted to go but I was curious, and so when I found out that there was a weekday mass at noon in a basement chapel, I thought that was sounded safe. And so I skipped lunch, I went, and what happened to me in that 40 minutes was life-changing. From the very opening rite, and then the penitential rite, and then the reading of scripture, 
it was like a perfect match for what Justin Martyr described in the first half of the second century, what we've been reading in a doctoral seminar. I thought there might be some residue that remained from the ancient liturgy of the early church, but it was like a perfect match. And so by the time I heard the words of consecration, I felt the last doubts just draining out of me. And I was in the, in the very back pew and I was just looking up and realizing it was no longer bread. It was Christ's body. And when he consecrated the chalice, I found myself literally drooling with this holy thirst. And I just didn't see it coming. By the time the people began to chant, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, three times in a row, that's when the lights came on for me because from years of studying the Bible and the book of Revelation, I knew that Jesus is called the Lamb of God 28 times in the 22 chapters of the apocalypse, but I never, I never knew why. And nobody had ever been able to explain it to me. So when I'm hearing Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God, and the priest proclaims the Lamb of God, while all you Catholics were going forward for communion, I was going backwards in my Bible and seeing not only the Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God, but the Holy, 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 the Hosanna, the Alleluia, the Gloria. And by the time everybody was gone at the end of the mass, an hour later, I was still sitting there stunned. I spent the rest of the afternoon in the library taking out books by the fathers. And that night I went home and I read through the book of Revelation, which I had translated in its entirety. But that night it felt like I was reading it for the very first time. I recount all of that in the Lamb's Supper because that for me was the divine Eureka moment. The next day I went back to mass and for the next two weeks I was secretly attending daily mass, falling in love with our Lord in the Holy Eucharist in an utterly unexpected way. And that expedited, that, that expedited my timetable in becoming a Catholic by about four years. <laughs> it became less than four months at that point. And it was a trauma that our marriage survived because of God's mercy. But yes, to answer your question, there was a moment. It's called the Mass, my first one. If your brother was marrying a divorced woman whose earlier marriage never been annulled, would you go to the wedding? That's a complex question that involves all sorts of circumstances that I don't know. And so before I answer it, let me step back and, and not try to dodge it, but just say the best thing to do is to sit down with a pastor who knows the canon law and who can really have the circumstances explained fully. But the bottom line is this, that attending a wedding in a church, attending the wedding of a Catholic is never just a kind of social ceremony. It really is an act where you are witnessing to a sacrament or not. And so, this is why the church obliges us not only to be baptized and to go to mass and the confessional once a year, but also to marry within the church. In some ways, it just seems so much easier not to rock the boat and then just to go. But I think it also provides an opportunity to bearing witness just to say, there is nothing I'd rather do than to be with you to celebrate. But because if in fact these circumstances are what you imply, if in fact they're not marrying in the church, but if they're marrying in a way that violates what Christ has established in Matthew 19, I would say it's not because I don't love you, it's because of how much I do love you. I'm gonna be with you, I'm gonna pray for you, but at the same time, you wouldn't want me to violate what I believe to be a word from Christ. And it's not like a set of handcuffs that keeps me from loving, but it is the truth that I think you would want me to fulfill. Chances are, you know, if in a worst case scenario, you, you don't go, you're going to have fences to mend. You're gonna have bridges to rebuild. And I think you also will have occasions to pray, to sacrifice, to, you know, offer up things. And I'm saying, not because I know that you can't attend, but in those really difficult circumstances where you find out from your pastor that no, I'm so sorry, but unfortunately in these circumstances, it would really be a violation of the church's law, but even more of the teaching of Christ for you to go. Know that there have been many people who've done this before and who have been used by God to bring people back, back into confession, back into the family of God. And so I hesitate to answer it this way, but on the other hand, being liked by everybody here is not as important as being able to look our Lord in the face on the last day and say, I think I was trying my hardest to be faithful to you and to your word. And I think that's the safest course for all of us.
I'm not sure if that helps, but I'll hand it over to Kimberly, who will say something much more helpful. There's a misunderstanding that to love someone is to let them do whatever they want. And so if you cross someone's will, you don't love them. That's a two-year-old mentality. It's ready to stomp away and have a temper tantrum because you didn't give them the candy that they wanted because you had a better idea that they needed to eat a meal first. This is not an adult response, but our culture says you don't love someone if you don't affirm whatever they do. A la the movie Fifty Shades of Grey and all kinds of other examples you can think of currently going on in our culture. So true love for someone means that we love them the way God wants us to love them. And the presumption is if someone has been married in the church, it was a valid marriage, unless and until the church court could declare an annulment. Part of what we need to say to our dear friends and family who may be in those circumstances is, really the presumption is it was a valid marriage, and so do not date. Do not begin a relationship that then you will long to have culminate in a marriage unless and until the Lord works through the church to say a real marriage never occurred and so you are free to marry. Um, I think we need to take a step back. Not only should you not marry, you should not be dating because that presumption is about a marriage occurred. Yeah. I would also say that, you know, people say, well, that's just a bunch of man-made rules. Unfortunately, or fortunately, you find it in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, our Lord is the one who said, if you divorce and remarry, you're committing adultery. The church came up with annulments, not Jesus. Jesus is the one who in Matthew 19, likewise, gives this teaching that shows us that marriage is not just a contract that humans enter, but a covenant that God himself seals. And he says, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And so, I mean, this is one of those things where our world doesn't understand but in part because we Catholics haven't spent enough time to really focusing on what it is we do when we get married. It's so much bigger and better and harder than we probably understood when we entered into it. I see fathers running out. I must have alienated him and everybody. <laughs> no, he's going to somebody else with the microphone. <laughs> Did you get your exercise? Um, do you have any dating advice Yeah, in Legacy of Love, um, Biblical Wisdom for Parenting Teens and Young Adults, I have a whole chapter on courtship. Now, some people date in a way that's similar to courtship, and some people court in a way that's indistinguishable from dating, and it's not about the word as much as it is an approach. Um, what I would really recommend is if you have teens, that you have your teenager read the chapter and you read the chapter and talk about it. Um, what we're trying to do is say there is a better way than simply starting at 12 or 13 and forming very emotional, strong bonds and continually getting together and breaking up when really the children are not yet mature enough to have a relationship that can go the distance to marriage. Rather, the teen years are great years for forming strong bonds of friendship. Friendship in the larger group, friendship with same sex, you know, guys with guys, gals with gals, having a social group. I mean, the opposite sex is of great interest, you know, at that age, but it doesn't have to become a, an intense one-on-one -on -one physical dating relationship. It needs not to be. And so I would just, you know, this is in the area of wisdom, not law, but I would welcome you to get a copy of that book and have, have your teen read it. I've had many teenagers Listen to these teachings that I've done on courtship and preparation for marriage and enjoying the teen years in a particular way and really get a lot out of it. I have a lot of suggestions for parents. We tried to make our home a place where teens would come, where they were welcome. Um, if they, your kids aren't driving yet, offer to take a group to the bowling alley, a group to the local you know, baseball game or football game. Be that source that makes it happen so that they can build strong bonds of friendship because peer relationships can be positive. They don't have to be negative. And the Catechism says that the virtue of friendship fosters the virtue of chastity. 
So if you've got a group of teens all deciding together, we're going to stay pure, we're going to stay strong, we're going to help each other be accountable, you, will, you want those friendships to form. That's going to bless your child. Um, so you may be one of the keys in, in having that happen. Uh, but I do think it's important for parents to know, keep parenting. Keep parenting through the teen years. Your, the culture keeps trying to say, step aside, you've done enough, you know, you know, other experts are going to get involved. Keep parenting. And especially dads, you are so important. You are so important to your daughters, uh, to stay close to them, to take them out on a date occasionally, to let them know how beautiful they are, and let them know your love for them. That will make them less likely to seek it uh, from, from guys who aren't worthy of it. And moms, you are really key in just continuing to, to be that affirmation to the young men in your, in your family. I just want to encourage you to keep parenting. Okay. Legacy of Love, I'd encourage you to get it. Yeah, she was referring to one of four books. There's only one chapter in the entire Bible written by a woman, Proverbs 31. She wrote four books about Proverbs 31. <laughs> Graced and gifted, beloved and blessed, legacy of love, and chosen and, chosen and cherished. And I recommend all four of those books. They're amazing. For women's Bible study, but also for parents and teens, especially girls. What she said about fathers affirming their daughters, I think in some ways is the most significant thing of all. Because so often men get too busy or they're uncomfortable. And I learned this not too late, but I learned it just barely enough time to really tell my daughter not only how beautiful she is, but just to really get close to her heart. And uh, it, it helped, I suppose, that she went to the university where her dad was the teacher, because then anybody knew she'd be, you know, they'd be dating Dr. Han's daughter, you know, oh <laughs> at the risk of life and limb. <laughs> but, you know, by the time she found the right guy, he asked me for permission and for her hand in marriage and all of that. And I honestly didn't think when Kimberly began teaching this that this was practical that this was doable, and then I've seen it done. And it's not easy, but it is possible in a way that our culture doesn't think it is, and it makes a big difference. And so you, you look at how teenagers simply obsess with the opposite sex and how we did when we were that age. And what we've got to do is rethink how we parent them through that in ways that my parents never imagined possible or necessary. So I really affirm what she's saying there too. Okay, where did Father go? There he is. Well, I mean, it begins with badgering and cajoling <laughs> and <laughs> complaining and criticizing. <laughs> Not! <laughs> you know, I, I think what we have to do with our, with our men is sort of what we have to do as men with our daughters, and that is affirm. Philippians 4 is like one of my favorite passages in St. Paul, where he says, if there's anything good, anything true, anything excellent, anything worthy of praise, think about those things. You know, not because there aren't negativities, but because we so often obsess with the negatives and we can see the problems rather than the solutions. But God never treats us that way. I mean, if God wanted simply to look at all my negatives, you know, as we read in scripture, if you should count iniquities, O Lord, who would stand? But he doesn't. He doesn't itemize my iniquities every day. He asks me to examine my conscience, but he affirms me to the skies, to the highest heavens. And if that's how he fathers me, that's how I've got to learn how to father and grandfather my kids. But I think in the process, it's also the key to marriage. And that is finding the good in the other and affirming it. And really also encouraging that, the, you know, that, that your husband build upon that as a husband, but especially as a father as well. And I would say to the men, Sometimes the greatest gift that we can give our kids is to love and romance their mom and to really go and make a date a regular priority. You know, once a month, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, we have, <laughs> we have once a month, I would say sometimes more than that, but I mean, uh, 
there, are, there, there are other things. Yeah, it should be more often. It should be once a week. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, hot water. It's on tape. Yeah. <laughs> we had been married three weeks, and I remember sitting across the table, and I said, so, how are you going to leave me spiritually? And I mean, he is a strong Christian man that I buried, but I'm not a wallflower. And he was like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so wives, don't assume your husband knows how to lead spiritually. Pray for him. Uh, encourage him. As much as possible, older men, call the younger men on. Yeah, yes. Offer to pray with them, man to man. Uh, really see if you can help open that door. And then wives, if your husband makes a suggestion, don't criticize it. Go with it. Try to support it. Because if he tries a couple times and gets shot down, he may not try again. Okay? And it doesn't mean that it's your timetable or all the things you would wish, but um, support and encourage as much as possible. And then maybe give him sources. Don't tell him how to do it, but give him sources that might encourage. And now that's on tape. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, I'm going to hand off here in just a moment. I would say this, though, that um, you know, look for men of God to enter her life, to affirm, to lead, to encourage, because it's not lost just because there isn't a strong male figure who is a biological father. Um, youth pastors, priests, teachers, you know. I know it's harder when it's a daughter, but I can think of many people, men and women, one in particular, you know, Father Michael Scanlon, who was raised without a real strong father present. And these religious ended up becoming father figures to him. And he has become, in, in my experience, the single greatest spiritual father, grandfather figure. He baptized our three sons. He really is just a mighty man of God. But because he had alternative fathering, and I think that's what we want to pray for in these circumstances as well. Yeah. to go to church. Right. Another, um, another source could be a grandfather or an uncle. No. Then I would just say, Lord, you know this is a need that has to be filled. And, and just pray that he, that he show you who that could be. Um, there are even instances where a brother could possibly become that. St. Joseph, no I, I think, I mean, the Lord has a great ministry to the fatherless throughout the Old Testament and just say, Lord, I appeal to you. I, I, I am missing this covering for myself, for my daughter, for my son. Please provide. And I, I hope you're surprised by the yeah. answer. I believe he wants to answer that prayer. I really do, but I'm sorry you don't have that support. Is there a resource that would allow one to make a synopsis of each of the titles that you have back there? Say I didn't want to read all of your books. That's a great suggestion. That is. I don't have a, a, a good answer for that. I would say that the best place to start is to read a book that we wrote together called Rome's Sweet Home. You already did? Okay, I mean, honestly, that is the best you know, point of departure. After that, I would recommend the Lamb's Supper in terms of people who have picked that up. And then from, from that point on, I might say signs of life. But you know, it's sort of like, how do you eat an elephant? Small bites, lots of them. And I would say, you know, whenever you're reading the Bible, the Catechism, me or Kimberly or anybody else, be patient, just go slowly. But you're right. I, 
That's a good question. I wish that I had like a one-page synopsis, but at this point I don't. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them are on salvation history. A lot of them are on our salvationhistory.com, stpaulcenter.com website. Uh, you can go to Amazon, and almost in every case, I was asked to write up a summary description of the book, and you will find it there on those pages as well. And you can also click that look inside, and you'll see the table of contents. And I hate to admit this, but what I often do when I get a book is I, I, I read the first page or two, and then I jump to the back and see what conclusions are going to be drawn and to see, okay, is it worth the trip, you know? And you can do that with my books and I won't be offended. <laughs> last, last question. Last question. You have scientific community beliefs are based on facts, beliefs that are not changed as you information. We've discovered. Um, my question is, how do you bridge the gap between beliefs that change and philosophical Is there anything in particular that you have in mind? I mean, that's sort of a great question, but it's sort of broad. Let me just begin to answer it and then let you follow up if you want, and then Kimberly can as well. I would say this, that the certainties are not primarily philosophical certainties as much as I love philosophy and especially Aquinas. I would say what is permanent, what is immutable are the mysteries of faith. When we look at the catechism and we learn about that God is an eternal Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the incarnation of the Word made flesh, that the Blessed Virgin Mary, that the sacraments, that all the saints meet us, I mean, there are more than enough mysteries that are absolute, unchanging certainties for us to feast upon in the Bible, in the catechism, that, you know, they might not seem timely to our culture because they're not timely, but they are timeless. And they're going to affect change in every time of history. And so by sort of majoring on the majors, those truths that are going to be true in a billion years, more than the, say the stock market or the, the National League results in the playoffs, you know, I think by training ourselves, by developing those habits, by finding the truths in God's word, and especially in the catechism, we're going to have a sure sense of foundation. So that if everything else changes and seems to fall around us, we're going to be able to build our lives and our families upon things that are sure and certain. Does that help? Okay. Amen. Yeah. I just want to say this too, in conclusion, and I know I'm speaking for Kimberly as well, from the bottom of our hearts, we want to say thank you for coming this day. Thank you for listening and also thank you for praying for us to go back home and to be faithful to all that we have shared. And please be assured of our prayers for you as well. God bless you. God bless you. Are these need to be? Yep. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you so much for all the hard questions, too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Can you can sign books for you? Yeah, we can sign books, too. Coming to Lincoln once again and sharing with us so much uh, rich, rich faith and theology and spirituality. And beyond that, for the great work you do through authoring books and traveling the country, but teaching there at Steubenville uh, mm. college students and future um, theologians and disciples wow. of Christ, we're forever grateful for your ministry and, and your wonderful family. God bless you. Let's say one concluding prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And with your Spirit. Amen.